everybody, it's such an honor and pleasure to have Laura Finzi from Emory with us today. Um, Laura, please tell us about living very interesting and uh, winding history. All right. Um, okay, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I'm gonna tell my story now. Um, I was born in Ravenna, Italy. My, um, just a second, I have a, thing is being recorded. I have an interference, got it, okay. I'm sorry. Um, I was saying I was born in Italy and um, my father was a civil engineer. He planned piers and harbors just like the one in Ravenna. My mother um, had graduated from the Conservatory Santa Cecilia in Rome as a pianist. We are three sisters and um, my um, father would have wished all of us to become civil engineers like him. Um, my sisters whom you see here in this photo with a friend because at the time the photo was taken, I was only two years old did become engineers, but um, instead I took a slightly different path. So my education started with my mother um, telling me tales from different countries so that I got exposed to um, different cultures. And also she told me tales from Greek mythology. So I had very strong female role models like Athena, the goddess of war and knowledge and justice. Um, of course, you know, um, Greek gods and goddesses were very anthropomorphic. They were powerful, yes, but um, they also had many flaws and weaknesses. They were very human. Anyway, um, from Ravenna, we, um, eventually moved to Trieste, where I attended the school mostly for children of the scientists um, at the ICTP. And from Trieste, we moved to Bologna, where eventually I attended a classical lyceum that um, you see here in the photograph. Um, following in this choice, the idea um, that my family had that a, um, education in the humanities is a robust, provides a robust um, intellectual framework for uh, then pursuing any kind of career. And so that means that um, I have a strong background in literature, history, philosophy, Greek and Latin. Uh, when the time came to go to college and I had to um, choose a department, I faced a dilemma. My father um, valued experience and I was the youngest. I realized that had I chosen engineering, um, my ward would have never carried the same weight as my father's or my sister's. So I had to be different. Yet, not any less than my father and sisters. At the time, um, the, at the University of Bologna, the um, departments that were considered the, the toughest were engineering and industrial chemistry, both perched side by side on top of a hill. So I enrolled in industrial chemistry and I ended up doing a thesis on um, chiral smectic liquid crystals and the structure and isotropy. And I realized doing that, that I really enjoyed doing research and I wanted to further my studies instead of going um, to get a job in the industry. Fortunately, uh, Carlos Bustamante uh, came to give a colloquium in the department. He was then an assistant professor at the University of New Mexico and recruiting graduate students. So I moved to Albuquerque where um, I started my training in, uh, um, in biophysics and I met my future husband, David Dunlap. After a few years, Carlos moved to the Institute of Molecular Biology um, 
uh, at the University of Oregon with the whole group. And uh, that was uh, a wonderful experience because the Institute brought together biologists, chemists, and physicists and provided a really fertile and wonderful environment. With Carlos, um, I studied optics, polymer physics. I built a, a microscope for differential polarization imaging, which I used to resolve and uh, spatially uh, resolve the chiral domains in thylakoid membranes in the chloroplasts. I also helped building a, the first generation magnetic tweezers, which we use to study DNA elasticity. Um, after this, I did a postdoc with Jeff Gellis at Brandeis University, where I learned um, the tether particle motion technique, um, a free force single molecule um, uh, technique that is ideally suited to study uh, polymer dynamics. And I became interested in uh, genetic switches. Both Carlos and Jeff were um, invaluable mentors. At this point, David and I uh, decided to go to Italy to start a family, which we did. Um, David was hired in the Department of Biotechnologies of the San Raffaele Hospital in Milano. And thanks to my experience in optics, spectroscopy, chloroplasts, I got a position as a researcher in the Department of Biology at the Università Statale di Milano, um, which you see here, this building. Um, and I was then um, studying energy transfer in photosynthetic antenna complexes as part of a larger research group. After a few years, I realized that what interested me most was actually DNA mechanics and understanding how it underlies genomic function. However, as a researcher, I had absolutely no resources to follow my scientific interests independently. So I owe my success to a bicycle, a conference, and a grant. The bicycle allowed me and my first undergraduate student to go from biology to the basement of a distant department in the medical school where I had found an old microscope that nobody was using anymore and we could use to start our um, DNA experiments again. The conference organized by David Ben-Simon and Van San Croquette at the Col Normal Superior reconnected me with the um, international community of single molecule scientists. And the grant gave me the, um, the resources to buy my own equipment and start my lab in a very small room crowded with incredibly talented undergraduate students. Now, I also am forever indebted to these three wonderful scientists Wilma Olson, Phil Nelson, Shankar Adya, who believed in me when um, I was at the beginning of my career. Um, after a while, um, David and I decided to return to the United States. And so we both found positions at Emory University, he in the medical school, I in the physics department. And uh, here I study how the mechanical properties of DNA influence the emergent behavior of the prokaryotic uh, genome and leveraging the power of several um, different single molecule techniques, my group and I can ask fundamental questions such as how can the enzyme that transcribes DNA motor its way down the double helix, which is coded by many protein roadblocks and coiled and folded in complex topological structures. Of course, I would not be able to do any of this without a team of wonderfully clever, driven and diverse uh, junior colleagues and without David with whom I have been collaborating for several years now. Now, um, 
I like to share some considerations. Um, our pathways are varied and the ways we navigate our environment, find opportunities, thrive and struggle, uh, reflect who we are. Our privileges and disadvantages certainly conspire to forge the scientists we become. It is important to understand our strengths and weaknesses, although it is not helpful to um, either take them for granted and or dwell on them. And finally, I think it's important to recognize that there exists a dichotomy between the desire and necessity, I would say, to be inclusive on one hand and the individuality inherent to our competitive world on the other hand. How we choose to navigate this dichotomy determines how supportive we are towards our colleagues and ultimately it reflects also on the quality of our science. And so finally, um, I'd like to share some things I try to practice that may be useful suggestions. And I start with this photograph where I am carrying my son who is six foot eight and 78 kilos. And I am significantly smaller. Um, and this is a, a kind of a metaphor to say, take on challenges um, going beyond one's comfort zone uh, can be humbling, but it's certainly stimulating. Uh, follow your nature and instincts. I've never been very good at doing things that I was not passionate about. So do what you enjoy, but do not isolate yourself, especially when the workload seems overwhelming. Find your communities, seek advice, look for mentors and listen to them, but be aware of clicks. Put yourself out there. Um, do not be afraid of other people's judgment or comparison to others. And finally, um, be an encouraging mentor because we are role models to those who are our juniors. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura, for that really inspiring talk. Um, audience, floor is yours. If you have a question, please feel free to unmute and just go for it. Can I ask a question? Go for it, yes, please. It was an amazing talk. Uh, my question would be is, um, what elements of your um, experience in uh, arts or like non-science subjects has inspired or influenced you in your scientific inquiry? Like uh, the, it may be scientific style or the way of thinking or uh, any sort of, you know, uh, understanding the scientific problem. Um, well, okay, so the thing that, um, that is, uh, that, that my family always says, right, is that um, the study of, of, of um, certain topics like philosophy, like um, Greek, like Latin, gives you a mental um, attitude for analysis and for um, synthesis and for um, reasoning that is very formative. Now, I don't believe that that is the only thing that will give you those traits, right? <laughs> but um, also other types of education can give you that. But certainly I do believe that there is some element of truth in the fact that those subjects can give you um, those. Um, abilities to develop your logic and your reasoning. And so I, I, I feel like I owe to, to that part of my background and that ability. The other thing is, uh, I think that I owe, um, that I owe to that um, type of education, a way of being, um, of approaching the world and difficulties and problems, a, a way uh, which is mostly a holistic view of, of the world um, that gives me balance, or, you know, I try at least, <laughs> maybe uh, not all the time. 
Abhinendra, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. This this was really a beautiful talk. Like it, it was so inspiring. It was so captivating. One thing though, I I wonder is I I, li I I listen to many of these talks and people always talk about a path and a journey and what 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 makes you into like what what we are right. But how do we decide the path? How do we choose the path? Oh. Um... I, you know, I think, I think we always decide our path and there is certainly, there are certainly elements of serendipity, um, of chance, right? Um, like, for example, it was chance that my um, undergraduate mentor was friend with Carlos Bustamante and invited him to give a talk in the department that, that I couldn't um, have decided myself, but I did decide um, that I liked science, that I wanted to do science and not pursue the humanities any further. I did decide that I wanted to go through a, a tough program that would give me a, a solid foundations in the sciences. And I did decide to leave Italy and you know to go um, study with Carlos. So I <laughs> I think it's a fortunate combination of, of serendipity and will, but, but you do carve your path. I, I mean, I didn't have an easy path, not all the time, but I, I, um, I didn't give up either. So I always looked for ways out and the bicycle was, is an example, right? That, that um, was really beautiful. <laughs> I was that in a was... situation where I was not completely happy and I had to to find a way out. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Laura, on that super inspiring note on behalf of the audience and clapping. Uh, thank you again for such thank a lovely and inspiring talk.